Dr. Varchin is a movement disorders neurologist with clinical and research expertise in invasive and non-invasive brain stimulation treatments for movement disorders. His clinical practice has a special focus on movement disorders and he uses the latest technological advances for the diagnosis and treatment of several disorders such as Parkinson's disease, tremors, dystonias, etc. With that being said, I'll hand it over to Dr. Merchant. Thanks, Jackie. I hope my uh, voice is clear and you can see my slides. So, so as I as Jackie said, I'm a movement disorder neurologist. I think several of you are patients of some of my colleagues uh, here at BI. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about the basics of, of my part as a neurologist as to what I think about deep brain stimulation and how I identify patients who are good for this uh, procedure. So, I have no real no conflicts of interest relevant to this talk. Uh, so let's talk about deep brain stimulation. And I wanted to show this picture here or this cartoon of a patient with uh, deep brain stimulation electrodes implanted. So what you see here is, is, is the procedure involves putting a burr hole on the sides of the skull and we introduce these electrodes using your brain scans into certain nuclei in the brain, which help modulate the brain networks to be able to improve your symptoms of Parkinson's disease or other disorders, which such as tremors and dystonia, uh, which are other indications for brain stimulation. After the procedure is done, all this wiring and everything goes under your skin. And, uh, and after that, it's connected to this pacemaker, just like a cardiac pacemaker, which, which most people are more familiar with. This is a pacemaker for the heart. For, for the brain and uh, and it's inserted under the skin and it it looks like it it is and it, it does nothing really pops out so so that's all internalized so this is a good picture diagram but at the same time I wanted to make sure that everyone understands that nothing comes out of the head or anything is sticking out and everything is internalized and no one sees what's going on and it's a very nice job that our surgeons do when when they implant these electrodes. So moving on, uh, let's talk about what are the factors which are which are important to consider for success of the surgery. First, most important thing is selection of the right kind of patients. We also want to make sure we have reasonable expectations. So it's not about making things 100% better or, or curing everything to do what you're dealing with, but it's about making things better. And, and what can be better is also important to identify before you undergo the surgery. Accurate electrode placement is very, very, very important. I cannot emphasize that factor, that a well-placed lead is more important than anything else that uh, that we want to accomplish with this surgery. Uh, but after that as well, it's important to have a good partnership to, to ensure that we are programming these leads using the most important and the most uh, effective contacts. And then long-term follow-up where we kind of have to go through through these programming parameters and revise and optimize them as we go along. So again, as I said before, DBS is not a cure. It is, it is another, but it's a very important and a very robust tool to improve your symptoms. What can it improve? It can improve your motor symptoms. What I mean by that is tremors, which means shaking. Second thing is dyskinesia. Some of you are aware of it or hope are, are probably dealing with it. This means that in Parkinson's disease patients, they don't, the problem is not to be able to move. But sometimes when you give medications or when the medication side effects manifest, you move too much. So that's called dyskinesias. So that's another important symptom that we can help improve with this surgery. Dystonia is another symptom which essentially improves, uh, which essentially means an abnormal involuntary painful at times contracture of the muscles, which can sometimes be relieved by this treatment. Motor fluctuations, what I mean by that is that a lot of you who have Parkinson's disease must have experienced this. When you take the medication, your symptoms get better, but before it's time for your next dose, your symptoms come back. So it's not a very meaningful uh, uh, in terms of quality of life that you have, that you have to keep chasing the medications to be able to have the sustained desirable benefit. Slowness and stiffness, which means that everything is slower and stiff, but when you take your medications, the symptoms are much better. So we hope that the DBS is able to provide that to you on a perpetual and a, on, a, on a continuous basis. It does not slow down the progression of the disease. And unfortunately, we don't have anything at this point 
um, in terms of medications and therapies that have been proven to be slowing down the progression of the disease, but hopefully we should have something uh, in the future soon. It takes time to achieve the optimal results. This is especially true for all the contacts, but especially for the G GPI or the globus pallidum, where we the effects of it is not are not immediate at times, but we have to wait for a month or sometimes longer for the maximum benefit to be achieved. So that's another reason why a lot of the times in my practice, when I program these pa program patients who have Parkinson's disease or activate the DBS, we don't want to do too much or make everything perfect because we need to allow for 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 you to get a, get uh, familiarized with the system and your brain more importantly to accommodate this new therapy. Uh, the response to DBS is not as good as is most of the times as good as your maximal or the best benefit you get from your medications like the levodopa you take except the exception to that is for tremor and that is itself an indication so a lot of the times when you have a bad tremor in parkinson's you must have noticed that your mobility is better when you take the medication the stiffness is improved but it does not quite help the tremor and this is un this is unfortunately true that in about 70 percent of the patients with parkinson's the response to tremor is fantastic but in about 30% of the folks, the response to tremor is never as good. And a lot of the times, that is the motivation why you keep increasing the dose. And then you end up having side effects, but the benefits for the tremor is still not optimal. So that's one of the indications which I emphasize that, you know, there are patients who have tremor, which does not respond to levodopa. And it's sometimes important to acknowledge that and consider this therapy perhaps relatively early on than you would consider otherwise. Uh, talking about medications, discontinuation of medication should not be the primary goal of this therapy. Though, though with certain targets, especially with the subthalamic nucleus, DBS, we can significantly reduce the doses or dependence on the medications. And more importantly, this on-off fluctuation, we can break that cycle of constantly requiring the medication. But most of the patients, if not all, still require to be on medications to a certain dose or a certain amount. So that's something important that you understand when you go through this therapy. Uh, symptoms which will most likely respond with, to DBS are tremor, like I mentioned, stiffness, which is rigidity, slowness, which is bradykinesia that we use in our neurologic terms, wearing off episodes. That means that when you take the medication before the next medication is due, your Parkinson's symptoms come back. And lastly, uh, is the uncontrolled involuntary movements or the dyskinesias, which a lot of the times happen at the peak doses of your medications. Uh, symptoms which are not changed by DBS are especially walking issues related with Parkinson's disease, which include balance problems or, or the other issue is freezing of gait. Uh, uh, some of you might be familiar with this or, or unfortunately might be experiencing this. Freezing of gait are episodes where you are, when you are walking in the middle of nowhere, your feet get stuck to the ground and you start shaking and especially happens when you are starting to walk or when you are turning or when you are going through doorways or when you are coming, suddenly come into an unfamiliar environment. Those are the usual triggers which lead to freezing of gait. Memory problems, hallucinations, softness of voice, swallowing issues or other issues which are not changed by DBS and they should not be the primary reasons why you undergo this therapy or this surgery. Essential tremor is another major indication and tremor, essential tremor means patients who don't have any other symptoms of slowness, stiffness, but they mainly have what is a tremor. Action tremors means when tremors which happen when you are using your limbs, for instance, say when you're riding or cutting your food, feeding yourself, drinking, those are action tremors. Postural tremors is when you hold certain objects in the hands or when you're holding your hands up that you know that. And sometimes a lot of folks have head tremors or the head shaking from side to side or up and down. Symptoms in essential tremor patients, which are not likely to respond as robustly as the limb tremors and the head tremors are problems with voice tremors, memory problems again, poor balance issues and hearing loss. So those are the things which are in the patients with essential tremor that we look for and, and we make sure that patients understand that these are the things which are not indicated indications for doing the surgery. And the third indication or third disorder where we do the surgery is dystonia. So some dystonia, as I, as I was briefly alluding to earlier, is a problem with abnormal involuntary contraction of muscles. So simple example is 
for dystonia, I would tell you, for instance, when you are moving your wrist down, for instance, what happens, what's supposed to happen is that your muscles which are contracting your wrist are supposed to activate, whereas the muscles which are supposed to extend your wrist are supposed to relax. So in dystonia, what happens, there is this imbalance between the activity and the inactivity between the muscles. And as a result of that, your hand goes into a contracted state when you're trying to perform activity in either direction because both those group of muscles start to contract. So that's what it's what we see in examination or when patients come to us and they tell us there is excessive pulling of muscles, there is abnormal postures, there is associated pain, as you can imagine, from contraction of these muscles. And, and these are the things which the DBS surgery can help to a certain extent. The best candidates, I would say, is because the evidence or, or when we have done a large number of patients, patients who have had this genetic mutation, what is called the GYT1 mutation, dystonia, um, there is the largest amount of evidence to help those patients. And the other thing is drug-induced dystonia, the certain medications of neuroleptic class, which causes dystonia. And sometimes these folks respond better to this surgery. Other indications where the surgery has been found to have a modest benefit is spasmodic dystonia. That is a kind of a dystonia of the vocal cords when your voice becomes strangulated as you speak. And certain types of secondary dystonia, what I mean by that is dystonia, which happens from structural damage to the brain from certain neurodegenerative processes, things like stroke and other damages to the brain. The, they don't tend to respond to the surgery and we don't like to encourage or, or pursue the surgery in those cases. Uh, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the approach we have here at Beth Israel or our program in how we approach these patients. We have a multidisciplinary approach that it's not just me or Dr. Aronson who's going to talk to you about who make these decisions. It's a multi we take use a team approach where I am one of the people who is part of the team who sees these patients, who understands, evaluates these patients and over, goes over the goals of the therapy and what and what cannot improve. Then Dr. Aronson goes over the patients. He also takes a look at the brain scans and evaluates the structural integrity of the brain to ensure that we're going to get a good response. We have a neuropsychologist who under, uh, and patients undergo memory testing and thinks uh, and understand that they can think well because sometimes people who are cognitively impaired or I would say a more familiar term to describe this is dementia. Patients who have dementia, there is probably worsening of the dementia-like symptoms when you do this surgery. So that's why we make sure that we check for that and we do a very robust uh, evaluation for that. And our neuropsychologists help us with that issue. We have social workers to ensure that the follow-up is ensured and you can maximize the benefits of this therapy. And in certain cases, we also use psychiatrists uh, to ensure that uh, you can maximize the benefit and we not we don't uh, push you in the wrong direction by doing the surgical uh, procedure in you. As far as the programming is concerned, after the surgery is over, we the first programming after the DBS surgery is about four to six weeks. The, the, the programming session, the initial one, takes a little bit longer where we evaluate each and every contact and make sure we have the best contact to be continuing the therapy with you. For Parkinson's disease, the visits are done in the off state. That means you will come in the morning of the programming procedure and you will not take the medication the night before. Uh, like you have done, a lot of you have done do when we do the on-off testing to know how much of the medication is benefiting you. A lot of the things that happen is also we check the incision sites. We make that each electrode and all the contacts are working well. The hardware is good. And uh, and and as I spoke before that, you know, as I say to my patients that DBS surgery is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So you want to make sure that you gradually increase the stimulation in a stepwise fashion, making sure you get a good benefit. At the same time, you don't get side effects. And at the same time, you want to make sure that the brain we have more room to keep going up and ensuring that you can have continued benefits of this therapy. So there are nuances to how we go about this stimulation. And it's not the same pattern in which we stimulate everyone and provide this therapy. The parameters which we adjust are the amplitude or the amount of current we deliver, the pulse width, which is like the, 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 the power of each stimulus that you get, and the rate. That means how many pulses you're getting per second. So these are the three main parameters that we monitor. Follow-up programming visits, we can consider increasing the stimulation slowly over time as the brain heals. We adjust uh, 
according to, you know, we avoid the side effects as well as we provide you the most benefit. And most importantly, as I said, I reemphasize is that it's not important to get all the benefit all the way from the first very visit, but you have to understand that we, we are looking for an incremental benefit and allowing you to maximize the benefits of this therapy. And sometimes you have to be patient for at least up to a year at times till we can achieve that goal and more importantly, sustain that benefit over several years after that. Uh, there are some resources which, which you can use to kind of learn more about this therapy, uh, about and, and indications and contraindications and other, other things about, uh, about this for Parkinson's, essential tremor and dystonia. And I encourage you to use these uh, resources. Uh, and our patients who are, who are here today are also excellent resources who have experienced this surgery and, 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 and the benefits and also sometimes not the best of the benefits, but but to some degree, uh, the the help got helped with the surgery. So so they are again, we are very thankful for them to be joining us, and 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 thank you for them to taking the time to join us today. Dr. Aronson serves as a functional neurosurgeon and director of epilepsy surgery at BIDMC and faculty at Harvard Medical School. He received his undergraduate degree from MIT and his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. He then trained in neurosurgery at the Massachusetts General Hospital, including a dedicated fellowship in functional neurosurgery and epilepsy surgery under Dr. Imad Eskandar. From 2016 to 2022, he directed the Functional Neurosurgery and Epilepsy Surgery programs at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in New Hampshire, introducing several new technologies, including a sleep MRI-guided DBS, laser ablation therapy, robotic neurosurgery, and minimally invasive epilepsy surgery. In November 2022, he was recruited back to Boston, joining BIDMC with a practice focused on DPS and epilepsy surgery. He also directs a federally funded research lab investigating how neurostimulation changes brain networks and focused on development of next generation neuromodulation technologies. And with that being said, I'll hand it over to Dr. Aronson. Thanks, Jackie. So um, here I do have a uh, few disclosures. I work with some of the companies on how to advance this DBS technology, um, but nothing in particular relevant to what we're going to talk about today. So when we talk about surgery for Parkinson's disease, and I did sort of keep the focus here on Parkinson's disease, um, but a lot of what we're talking about does apply to the other conditions we use DBS for, as uh, Dr. Merchant mentioned, um, including dystonia, essential tremor, and then also obsessive compulsive disorder and uh, epilepsy, all approved um, indications for DBS. But really for, for Parkinson's disease and essential uh, tremor as well, we really had two options in our surgical armamentarium. Uh, one was lesion surgery, which is destruction of a particular area of the brain. Um, really a targeted destruction, either the thalamus or the globus pallidus, called a thalamotomy or a pallidotomy. And while we can destroy it either with heat or radiation, the, the ultimate goal is a very focused destruction. And nowadays we could do that with a focused ultrasound, but the the essence of what we're doing actually is the same as it was in the 1950s, which is a focus destruction. And the other is deep brain stimulation, which we're going to mainly focus on today. To go over again, DBS. So this is a um, similar picture, um, but it's a fully implanted system, all right? So nothing is, is over the skin, everything is implanted under the skin. And for the most part, it just is on and you don't have to, once it's programmed, think about it, mess with it, touch it. Um, it just is, is on and no one knows that it's kind of there and working. There are three components. There's, uh, and I don't know if my mouse shows up, but there's a portion in the brain, which is the electrode. There's usually one on each side of the brain if we're targeting both, both sides. And then there's extension leads that come down the neck. And often uh, today we'll do the two extension leads, so one for each side, coming down the same side of the neck, and then a single battery. The original devices, often folks had two batteries. Nowadays, there's one battery that has two ports, so we can program each side separately, but there's only one, one battery implanted in the chest. And we call it a battery, but it's really the battery and brains of the whole device. And that can either be a non-rechargeable, we call a primary cell that might last um, anywhere around five years or um, slightly longer, 
or it can be rechargeable where you charge it regularly um, and then that can last 15 years, um, but you do have to remember to charge it um, as often as every other day. And then the other component is a patient programmer. So uh, as Dr. Merchant mentioned, the programming side of this, um, equally important to the surgical side is the programming side. You also do get a patient programmer so you can adjust some parameters on your own, turn it on or turn it off. Or if you needed, let's say, to get an MRI, you could put it into an MRI mode and make sure you can still get an MRI. So those are all of the components that we're talking about. And I like to go over this history of DBS because you know sometimes when you first hear about this, it seems like you know this is a, a very um, new technology and maybe something new, experimental or risky. Um, but what we're doing actually comes out of observations back to the 1930s. Uh, Wilder Penfield was a neurosurgeon who actually mapped the brain with stimulation. So we know the brain works through electricity. And in the 50s to 70s, folks were looking at using electricity as a treatment in the brain. Then came the era of ablations, as we talked about. And then it wasn't until 1987 that Aleem Benabid is a surgeon, a neurosurgeon who's working uh, in France, who demonstrated that uh, DBS could uh, affect tremor in Parkinson's disease and epilepsy. It took about a decade to get approval from the FDA for that, for central tremor, and then finally Parkinson's disease a few years later. And originally it was approved for a fairly advanced Parkinson's disease, but we learned that it could be helpful earlier in the disease course uh, and several studies came out. And then once we had DBS, we started learning more about how we could improve it. So asleep, which we'll talk about, meaning with patients not awake, um, also segmented leads where instead of having just one, um, one option of stimulating at a level, we could break that off and potentially steer the electricity. And then um, later the ability to record activity from the brain and use those recordings to help guide our programming. And just in time for the pandemic, the option for remote programming. So rather than having folks need to come into the hospital, they could even be programmed sitting in their homes um, kind of over Zoom. So we talked about the ablative era, right? And so what, what kind of drove um, looking for an alternative. Uh, those procedures work pretty well, um, but for the most part, they were limited to a unilateral treatment. You can only really treat one side. If you try to treat both sides, the complication rate was very high with speech problems, gait problems, you know, walking, psychiatric disturbances. Um, so a lot of folks looked at you know, this DBS idea uh, into the 80s and early 90s and showed that DBS was superior to the ablations that you know, people were doing again back to the 1950s, and this is still true today. So while the technology has changed and we can use an ultrasound to create the heat, ultimately, you know, DBS is thought to be, you know, significantly better um, than these ablation surgeries. And um, I was going to talk about Parkinson's disease symptoms. I think Dr. Merchant went over, you know, the motor symptoms, which primarily is what we look at uh, treating in DBS. Of course, there's non-motor symptoms as well. Um, mood changes, cognitive changes, trouble with sleep, uh, autonomic dysfunction, meaning digestive problems, um, orthostatic, uh, meaning blood pressure variability. So there's other symptoms of Parkinson's disease, certainly, um, but we're really focused on DBS and treating the motor symptoms. Often about five years, though, after starting medication therapy, folks are developing dyskinesias, the unwanted movements, or those on-off fluctuations where it seems like medications are helping, but now after an hour, the effect is starting to wear off. And that leads to more and more difficulty getting around, worsening gait, worsening balance, refractory tremor, tremor that used to be controlled, being controlled a lot less well, more stiffness, uh, and some resistance to cinemat. Again, folks usually end up taking higher doses or more frequent doses of, of medications. And that can also lead to side effects. Um, taking more medications may lead to more dyskinesias, more unwanted movements. So um, I have a similar slide of what responds to DBS. And um, you know, again, just to emphasize that there's motor symptoms that, that do respond to DBS and some symptoms that do not. So you know, when I first meet with a patient, we talk a lot about you know, you specifically as a patient, what are you looking to get from DBS? What symptoms are the most frustrating and difficult that you're hoping DBS will improve? Um, if it's cognitive symptoms, then 
Now, again, DBS probably won't help with those cognitive symptoms, but if it's that you know, tremor that used to be well-controlled is really not controlled anymore, then I think that we have a lot to talk about for uh, the possibility that DBS can help. And then there's some variability in, in improving that middle column of speech balance and gait freezing. Um, so when folks typically come to see me to initially talk about DBS, and I encourage people to come as early as you know, their diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, I think it can be a useful conversation to, to think about, you know, often people are, are absolutely not ready to think about surgery, don't want surgery, don't want DBS, when they first come and meet me, but they're curious about it, they've heard about it. And I think that's really important. How are you supposed to sort of figure out if if DBS is an option for you or when it might be an option if you know there's a lot of questions about what it is and, and when you might know if you're ready. So I think it's always helpful to at least um, meet with a neurosurgeon and learn um, about what DBS is involved and when it might be an answer for you. So we talk a lot about, about again, your symptoms, how they've progressed, what your initial symptoms were, what responded to medication, what is not responding to medication, um, what your goals from surgery are. If you have other medical problems, it is a surgical procedure. So sometimes folks are on you know, blood thinners and we need to think about holding blood thinners for surgery. Um, and then any cognitive or psychiatric symptoms, um, whether they're related to medications um, or you know, currently an issue or not as much of an issue anymore. And all patients to, who are thinking about DBS uh, as an option undergo two assessments. One is on-off testing, where this is performed by a movement disorders neurologist, and you come into the office um, off of your medications and undergo a motor score evaluation, take your medications, get evaluated, and we're looking to score your improvement from medications. So understanding that folks who do respond to medications uh, again, that sort of best on time, are good candidates for DBS, um, with the exception that tremor often improves more with DBS um, than it does with just medications. The other test is neuropsychological uh, evaluation, and this is performed by a neuropsychologist, that's a PhD uh, typically, who is trained to administer these cognitive tests. And our goal is to identify factors that might limit your response to DBS, or if we're you know, concerned that the, the diagnosis might be a Parkinson's plus syndrome, you know, Parkinson's, but not quite typical Parkinson's, um, we want to assess that. Um, now, I will say, you know, we're, we're very rarely surprised by the result of these tests. Folks usually know if they respond to medications, um, they know um, what their cognition is looking like, and certainly, you know, we can talk to family members as well. Um, so these aren't, you know, usually surprising results, um, but they are standard evaluations, and we do get them in all patients. So people often ask, you know, who's the candidate for uh, DBS? What's, what makes a good candidate? And to me, I think a clear Parkinson's disease diagnosis, so not a typical Parkinson's disease or some of these other conditions like multi-system atrophy, um, if you've had a good response to Cinemet. Now, that might be in the past. It might be, hey, three years ago, this worked really well. I would never have come to see you, but lately it's working less well. That's fine, but folks who've had a good response in the past, and again, we think about your best response to leave it open. Now, it might be that you're having, you know, wearing off issues. It might be that tremor is now refractory. Um, but again, it's thinking about, you know, in that time frame, your best response um, over the last few few months, even if it's brief and you're having issues with wearing off. And good cognitive function, um, which, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, you can't say, well, I don't know, I, I think my memory is a little worse. Um, I don't mean you know that sort of cognitive dysfunction, but um, for for folks who've had you know, very significant cognitive dysfunction to the point where they're not able to really take care of themselves well, that then becomes uh, a concern. How we do the surgery has changed a lot. Um, traditionally, we did the surgery awake. Uh, awake DBS surgery means a patient is. Um, exactly that, awake, maybe with just some mild sedation. And we um, typically use something like a frame, which gives us like an XYZ coordinate system so we can accurately um, hit our target and we can use recordings in the brain um, in combination. And you know, the, the problem with awake surgery, and this is you know the way, um, the way I trained initially at Mass General, and the problem with that is um, it can be uncomfortable. 
uh, for patients to be awake during brain surgery. Uh, it can be noisy to hear drilling, and it certainly can be um, anxiety provoking and a little bit claustrophobic. So uh, about six years ago, um, I started moving away from doing awake uh, deep brain stimulation surgery um, as some data came out showing that there's some alternatives. And you know, one thing that drove that was this revolution in stereotactic neurosurgery technology. So lots of devices and robots. Um, and so there were options to kind of get us away from these traditional methods. And so the first thing that I, I moved to was a robot. This was a, a head mounted robot where um, we could make it, I think, more comfortable for patients because they can move their head around during surgery um, and not necessarily be kind of tethered in these um, older frames. But while that's more comfortable, uh, it turns out that you know, we can also do the surgery with patients asleep under general anesthesia. Sort of how most surgery is done, whether you're getting you know, a hip replacement or your tonsils taken out. So a sleep DBS means DBS under general anesthesia. And the reason that that's doable today in a way that it really wasn't an option in 1997 when this was first approved is that there's newer advanced MRI sequences for what we call direct targeting. Direct targeting means I'm not looking at some standard offset from the center of a patient's brain, but rather looking at a specific patient, this patient's MRI, and using that MRI to point out the spot where I am aiming. So I can choose my target, whether it's a subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus uh, or the VIM for a central tremor, um, based on that patient, that specific patient's anatomy and connectivity. And when I say connectivity, I mean the wiring of the brain. And that uses uh, another advanced MRI technique called tractography. And we can use real-time imaging in the operating room, either CT scans or MRI scans, to make sure that, as I said, I've that spot on the MRI I'm aiming for, I can make sure that I'm actually hitting that spot with extremely high accuracy. And because folks are asleep under, under general anesthesia, um, we can combine what typically was a two-stage surgery where we put the electrodes in the brain, and then as a second stage, the wires down the neck and the battery uh, which is usually done about a week or so apart, we can now combine that into one surgery. And so we can do all parts in one surgery. It takes about three to four hours. And then folks stay in the hospital for one night. And when I say that there's advanced MRI sequences, what I mean is, so this is a typical standard MRI. And here's a target um, that we might think about aiming for. Here's a little bit of a zoom in image. Um, this is all for sort of the same shade of gray. I would not be able to tell you that this is really the spot that I'm aiming for based on the standard MRI. So we can say it all looks gray, but we have newer MRI sequences. So this is one called QSM. Now our subthalamic nucleus is nice and bright white compared to the background of gray. And now we can actually see where we want to go. A little bit of a bigger image. Again, we can see we're aiming for the bright white structure. And we can differentiate that from the substantia nigra, and I can see where on that patient <clears throat> I'm aiming. And I can, I can do that, again, because there's newer MRI sequences, and we can incorporate imaging in the operating room to make sure that I'm not just near it, uh, I'm on that spot you know, with millimeter accuracy. And another technique uh, is using the wiring of the brain. So this is a patient for tremor. Um, these sort of noodles um, are actually the wiring of the brain. And I'm aiming for this pink sort of set of noodles, which is called the dentato rubrothalamic tract. So that's where I'm aiming. And I'm trying to avoid the green and the blue, which are going to cause side effects. So you can see here in orange, a little hard to see through the noodles. Those are the DBS leads that I put in. And again, using the wiring of the brain, of a patient-specific brain, that's their own wiring based on their MRI to target accurately. And then it turns out, you know, there's been a lot of studies looking at this and a lot of folks when this first came out, myself included, had some questions about, is a sleep DBS gonna be as good? You know, if it's not broke, why, you know, why fix it? Um, but I think it is a little bit um, broke because there are patients who, again, don't want to be awake for surgery. And that was, I think, pushing folks maybe away from DBS. And all of these studies basically suggest that a sleep DBS is as good as awake. So it's not that we're doing a better job than we were doing awake, 
but we're doing, I think, an equivalently good job. Um, and the advantage is that we're not forcing folks to be awake for surgery. So I'll say, uh, just to conclude, DBS surgery, I think, is uh, safer and easier than in prior generations. We have better technology that we're implanting. We have better methods. Um, when and whether to undergo DBS, that's a very personal decision. So I think, you know, talking uh, with your neurologist and your neurosurgeon, um, it's really a conversation. Um, you know, it's not a hard sell. It's a discussion uh, about whether DBS is right at this point. And it may not be right now. It might be something that, you know, in a year or two might be the answer. Um, awake and asleep surgeries do remain options. Uh, but again, asleep surgery results are on par with awake surgery results. And again, that's all due to some of the advanced imaging techniques that make it possible to do what we call direct targeting. Again, picking the target based on the MRI that makes a sleep surgery possible. And I will stop there and stop sharing my slides. Thank you, Dr. Aronson. If anyone has questions, we have a few minutes for Q&A. You can put them in the Q&A or the chat box at the bottom of the screen. That's a good question. Um, you can, absolutely. Um, generally, I'd say, you know, we wait till, till you've hurt, healed from surgery. The only um, interference that I know of is or absolute contraindications, you can't scuba dive past um, 100 meters. Uh, and then you also can't use um, some welding equipment because of the uh, induced currents from welding equipment. But for the most part, um, you can still use power tools and there's no interference. Um, you can certainly uh, use you know, hot tubs, tanning beds, again, once once the wounds are healed. That's where, you know, as I said, the, the battery, it's really the battery and brains. So when, for example, Medtronic came out with their newest technology that lets us read signals from the brain, that's backwards compatible with all the folks who've had electrodes implanted. The electrodes are platinum iridium wires. So there's not a whole lot to them, but it's it's within the battery battery that I think matters for a lot of the new technology. And DBS is tunable and reversible. So if some cure came about and you wanted to have the DBS removed, then you could you know, have, that, have that done and there's no permanent destruction to the brain. Um, it has to be replaced if it's a non-rechargeable. That takes about half an hour. You can do it with just mild sedation or with you completely out. Um, if it's a rechargeable battery, then, you know, that should last about 15 years for the rechargeables. Uh, so, so I would say yes and no. It depends on what is the problem with the sleep to begin with, right? So a lot of the times I think if, if the problem with the sleep is that you take your medications after dinner and then you go to bed and then you are sleeping and you're not taking anything all night till the next morning, what typically happens, unfortunately, later in the stage is your medication effects wear off, just like they do in the daytime. And at nighttime, it's a little bit more challenging to kind of decipher that because you cannot get those same symptoms, but you feel this feeling of not feeling quite yourself. You feel restless. And these are the symptoms what we call is referred to as behavioral offs or where, where the dopamine, you read it for your motor symptoms, but you also need for your brain to function or be calm in a certain way. So the manifestations of getting off at nighttime can interfere with your sleep. So if that is the reason why your nighttime sleep is affected, or a lot of the times you can say painful dystonia creep in at nighttime, or, or your ability to move is affected because you cannot turn in bed at nighttime. So if, if that is the reason why you are not getting a restful sleep or not able to sleep, then yes. So again, as I said uh, earlier, a simple, a simple way to assess these things is, are these problems fixed by taking the medications which you take for Parkinson's disease? And if that is able to improve your symptoms, that is a good answer that it's going to be improved by your brain stimulation surgery. Because with DBS, you don't turn it off at nighttime. You, it keeps going. So just like the medications, 
they're going on at all the times. Your DBS is still helping your symptoms at nighttime when your medications are no, you're not taking the medications in the middle of the night. So, so I hope that answers your question. So, so the answer, it depends on, you know, what is the primary cause of the sleep? If it is related to your Parkinson's related on off fluctuations, then yes. But if it is something else or something more complicated, then it's hard to kind of know uh, whether the DBS will help with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Merchant, Dr. Aronson. I think now we'll turn it over to our patient ambassadors.